Our culture, just like any other culture in the world, has an opinion on the subject of femininity. They have an opinion of what it should look like, what, it, what should identify you as a female, what should identify you as a wife, what should identify you as a woman. A lot of where we get our culture from is through film and television. These two media outlets influence us more than anything else in society. Our national, one national newspaper recently came out with an article talking about the new form of feminism in our culture. They saw that it comes from film characters who are warrior princesses and comic book folklore that use their swords and their brains, riding fabulous horses and racing on foot. Their mission is to kill the enemy, stand and conquer and destroy. That's the new image. That's the new form of feminism in our culture. That's what it should be. They reference characters such as Xena, the warrior princess, Powerpuff Girls, I don't know if some of you guys used to watch that, Wonder Woman, Sarah Connor in The Terminator, and others that are famous for being women warriors. One movie producer or critic is quoted as saying, this is what you should look like if you are a woman in today's culture. Then there's the question of a wife. What should a wife look like? What should, you, what should identify you as a wife? Our culture has an opinion on that as well. And it's a very interesting opinion that comes through television. They give you a few different options of what you can look like as a wife. One of the options is the show like Desperate Housewives, where they seem more interested in the art of gossip and scandal instead of keeping a job or taking care of your family. There are the housewife of the Camelot era of the show Mad Men, who seem to do nothing better than to make good martinis and look fabulous. That's their role. Then there are the Stepford Wives, a portrayal of what a good wife is supposed to look like. Some of you have seen the movie Stepford Wives starring Nicole Kidman, who plays a woman named Joanna. Joanna loses her job, moves to a little small town in Connecticut where things don't seem to be accurate. Everyone seems to conform to whatever their husbands want, um, and the women just seem content to do whatever the husband tells them. They seem to be too good to be true, seemingly perfect. These are all the different ideas of what a wife should look like. There are all kinds of ideas of what it looks like to be a woman in our culture, what it looks like to be a mother, what it looks like to be a wife. And as we dive into the topic this morning, we've got to look at it to see what does a wife look like that knows and loves Jesus? What does a wife look like that is passionately in love with our Savior? How does the gospel play into your life if you're a woman today, if you're a wife, if you're a mom, if you're a female? And I'm going to look at these three areas I'm going to look at three areas from our passage that we read, and I admit they're dangerous waters that we're diving into this morning. I'm going to talk about some things that tick people off. These are dangerous words, especially for women that are feminist. I understand that. However, Scripture is our guide. Scripture is our influence. And we're going to look at the Bible and see what God has to say and leave it there. Whether you want to argue with me later, that's up to you. But I'm going to just show you what the Scripture teaches. Here's what we're going to look at. First off, we're going to look at wives and the spirit. We start with that one because we realize that applies to both, male and female. That applies to you guys as well. The role of the Holy Spirit in your life is a prerequisite before he gets into husbands and wives and what they should be doing. The Holy Spirit has to influence you. The Holy Spirit has to transform you. It has to change you before you can be the godly husband, the godly wife that God calls you to be. Then we're going to look at wives and submission and wives and significance. These are three things that we're going to be looking at this morning. Let's begin. Wives in the Spirit. Verse 18 begins, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In the Greek, this entire sentence, this entire thing is one sentence. He just goes on and on with one continuous thought. He goes from one breath from verse 18 all the way to verse 22 where he begins to talk about wives. It's all one thought. It fits together for him. He's not changing subjects at all. All of this fits together. Being filled with the Spirit leads to a godly wife. Being filled with the Spirit leads to a godly husband. He's interested in the application of the Holy Spirit in our life. It's interesting that he uses an interesting connection between illustration of being filled with the Holy Spirit. He illustrates it or compares it to being drunk. It's a great illustration, something that we can understand. Either some of you have 
have been drunk, and you know what that's like, or you've seen friends who have been drunk. Um, there no time for testimony this morning, but um, you know what that's like. You've seen what a person's like who's been influenced by alcohol. You see how they're completely transformed or different. It loses its inhibition. It becomes a completely different person. I was um, in seminary in 2003, um, living in Tulsa, and one night around 2 in the morning, the sirens went off in our city. The tornado was coming in, and I happened to be awake because I was on the phone talking to a young lady who happened to be my wife several months later. But when the sirens went off, we were forced to evacuate our apartments and head to a bunker in a local hotel. And so we had to go and hide there. Already being awake and alert, me and my roommate decided that we were going to go try and get some of the other neighbors out and help them go get to the bunker safely. We got this one family. We get there. The wife and the children are ready to go, but the husband is drunk like anything. He's crazy. One too much drinks. One too many drinks. And we're trying to convince him that he needs to go. We're trying to convince him that he needs to get safe. And the only things that come out of his mouth is, hey, if the tornado comes, I'll just fly right into it and I'll stop it. These are the things that he's saying. And he's talking as if he's completely serious. He, we're telling him about being safe, about his children, that he needs to be there for them. And he goes, I'll just stand here and the tornado won't touch me. The difference between Superman sober and Superman drunk was incredible. There is a world of difference. Paul is saying by way of illustration, don't be controlled by some substance, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Don't lose your inhibition to be set free to foolishness, but lose your inhibition to be set free to the Spirit and enjoy all that God has for your life. Don't become a different person and act foolish and say things that you later regret, but become a different person and become filled with the Holy Spirit and become a person whose life has eternal significance and value. And he's contrasting these two things. The question that you have to ask is, how do you do this? To be filled with the Spirit is a continuous thing. And I don't have the time this morning to go into the difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit, which happens the day you're saved, and being empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is God equipping you with the gifts of the Spirit, like speaking in tongues and prophecy and gifts, all of those things which we believe are still relevant and still applicable for the church. I don't have time to go into that. I did a sermon last year in the book of Acts that talks about that. You can look on that online. But being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that's supposed to happen all the time. It's a continual thing that happens to you. It's supposed to happen every single day. He's talking about the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's something that you do to make that happen. His work in you has something to do with what you do as well. You work together in this in being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in the rest of the passage about what it looks like, what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't tell us how you're filled with the Holy Spirit. In Colossians, Paul uses the same topic, and, this, and he begins the discussion like this. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching, admonishing one another. And he continues, he says the exact same thing he says in Ephesians, and he goes and he says, now, because of that, wives, submit to your husbands. That's fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. The same context, but he begins by saying, let the word of God dwell in you richly. What do you conclude from that? The word of God, the word of Christ, the gospel, is what you drink continually so that you can be controlled by, filled by, dominated by the Holy Spirit. This is what you need to soak in on a continual basis. You need the Word of God in your life. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to do that. The word let, let the Word of God, means to allow, invite, welcome, give yourself over to, let Him take control, to welcome the Holy Spirit to work in you. It is to invite Him to teach you. The point is, you don't just read your Bible and say that you read your scriptures. You read your Bible to allow the Word of God to transform you. You read your Bible to allow the Word of God to convict you. The point is you can know a lot about Scripture. You can know the history of Scripture. You can know the theology of it. You can know the verses. You can have it memorized. You can have the references memorized. And yet you can still be completely dry when it comes to being filled with the Holy Spirit. The word dwell in you richly, it's the idea of being completely immersed, completely drenched. I was in Atlanta last week, missed you guys, but I was there for Atlanta for work, and we uh, were doing some fundraising for work, and we had a golf tournament. 
The same rain that was happening here last Saturday would like double over there. And I stood outside in the rain for about eight hours. I came in, there wasn't a part of me that was dry. Every part of me was drenched. That's the same word, same idea that Paul is using here in this text. You need to be completely drenched, completely consumed, completely filled, immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's the idea of this word. It's to be completely soaked in the word of God that it's inside of you. Completely soaked in the word of God that it's the fuel that the spirit of God uses to burn in your life. So the question comes, and that's where we start. Are you filled with the word of God? Does the word of God influence you? Does the role of the spirit of God through the word of God influence the way that you play out your marriage whether you're a man, a woman, a husband, a wife, a father, or a mother, are you being filled with the Spirit by the Word of God? Being filled with the Spirit is where the gospel is driven into the very center of your being. It's where God takes Scripture and He drives into you who He is and what He's done into your heart and drives it into the center of your heart, the center of your life. So that more than just verses are memorized and theology is known, but your, your lives are completely transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. Not just information, but information that changes you on the inside. The gospel is driven deep. It means you're inviting God to speak to you. It means that you're seeking his guidance. It means that he, you're inviting his supernatural involvement in your life. It means that you're welcoming his help through prayer and through the reading of the word. It means that you're seeking his input and guidance in your life. It means God, Speak to me and correct me when I'm wrong. It means you're unleashing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Some of you guys are dried up. There's no work of the Spirit of God in your life. You're a believer, you love Jesus, you go to church, but you have no work of the power of the Spirit in your life. There's no involvement, there's no affection for God in your heart because there's nothing to burn. There's no fuel, there's no wood in there. You aren't soaking in the Word of God. How do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Remember, I'm not talking about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not the gifts that we're talking about. How do you know that the Spirit of God is inside of you? How do you know that you're a child of God? Paul says three things here in our text that should be evidence in your life that if you are a child of God, evidence in your life that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Number one, he says singing is there. The first evidence of the Spirit of God in your life is that you sing. Psalms 33 talks about praises flowing out of our lives. It becomes a characteristic of our life. You might say, I'm a horrible singer. Doesn't matter. I can't play anything. Doesn't matter. I can play the radio and that's about it. Doesn't matter. I can't, I can't sing alone. And you got guys on stage that play the drums, play the guitar and lead worship all at the same time by themselves. How, I can't do any of that. Doesn't matter. He's saying that your heart should be overflowing with gratitude and singing to God. Singing has always been around in the history of the world. Job 38 talks about when God was creating the earth, the angels were singing. Singing was a characteristic of the people of God throughout the ages. Only in the dark ages did singing stop and the church go from singing and praising and worshiping to a form of liturgy where it was just chants. But the Reformation happened and when they realized the change of the gospel, of God has influenced and changed us. The church went back to its singing and rejoicing and worshiping. Singing is a part of who we are as a church. You see it from Genesis all the way through Revelation. See, that's why when you look at Revelation, you see that singing goes on forever. My job will end when I die. You don't need preaching when you get to heaven. But Bill's job will continue even there. And what he does here will get better when he gets up there. He will be much better than he is. He'll probably play 10 instruments at a time and be able to lead in worship. Singing should be a characteristic of your life. Are you filled with joy where flow, song flows out of you? Singing says that God is so good to me, God is so great to me, that it's not just good enough to talk about it. It's not just good to think about it, but it's an emotion that's involved. There's joy that comes through me when I sing about it. Singing is a characteristic of your life if you're filled with the Spirit. The second thing is that you're thankful. This is another expression of the work of the Spirit. The gospel drives deep into your heart and you become thankful. Why? You're thankful because you see that in your sin, you deserve hell. You don't deserve anything good from God. There's nothing in you that causes God to change you. 
God should not intervene on your behalf. He's free to let you go in your own way, but he doesn't. He gets involved in your life. He chooses to intervene in your life. He chooses to stop you in your tracks. And he chooses to save you and pull you back before damnation enters your life and you would destroy your life forever. That's what we see on the cross. Jesus willingly, joyfully enduring the cross the joy that was for the joy that was set before him. That's why the gospel drives us to a life of thankfulness. It is the work of the Spirit of God moving our affections and making us thankful. Ladies, are you thankful? Wives, are you thankful? Are you known for being thankful? Are you known for your complaining? Does gratitude flow out of your words and song? Or is it filled with bitterness and griping and complaining? Do you realize in life, good or bad, whether it's going well or it's miserable, it's just icing on the cake because Jesus has already done everything for you. Everything that matters. Everything of ultimate significance has been accomplished for you. So you can bear under whatever you are going through. You can be thankful because he loves you. He's accepted you. Is your life characterized by thankfulness? And the third thing is submission. Submitting. Submitting is not necessarily barking out commands as much as it is putting other people's desires and preferences above your own. Guys, if you notice the verse... It says you submit mutually one to another. It's not just the wives submitting to you, seeking out their best interests. This is another implication of the gospel, another work of the Spirit of God, driving that into our heart. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It means you die to yourself. You discover the gospel erodes and kills self-centeredness from your life. It is in the gospel that we see that we are worse than we ever thought we were because God himself had to die for us. Nothing we could do could change us. Nothing we could do can influence, make God like us. We were worse than we think we are. God himself had to die for us. But in the gospel, we also see the flip side. We are more loved than we could ever imagine because God himself died for us. He didn't send a goat, he didn't send an animal, he didn't send another human being, but he himself came in the form of flesh, took up our cross, took up the cross, bore our sins, bore our penalty, died on our behalf. He took our sins. See, in the cross, I lose my sense of self-centeredness. It humbles me and affirms me at the same time. It removes self-centeredness and self-neediness at the same time. I don't need things from people. I don't need to get approval from people. I don't need their acceptance. It's nice to have, but I don't need it. When the gospel is the center of your being, you received everything you already need. You can serve without having anything given to you because Jesus has approved, accepted, and acknowledged you. That's why Paul is saying here that he connects this to marriage. I love it because he doesn't change the subject at all. It's not like I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit for a little bit. Okay, we're done here. Now let's move to marriage. It's all one context. It's all one thing. He's saying this is a continuation. This marriage thing is a work of the Spirit of God in your life. It's a work of the Spirit of God in your heart. He is telling the husband and the wife to submit to one another. That to the wife, he says, submit to your husband. In other words, husbands are to seek ways to love your wives. Seek to prefer her above yourselves. Seek to take care of her. Seek not to just come home and say, feed me, provide for me, do everything for me. But you come home and say, how can I serve you? How can I be a blessing to you? Leadership is not about barking out commands, ruling, or commanding your wife, regardless of what your wife thinks, knows, or feels. That's not leadership. That's foolishness. That's stupidity. Wives, in order to make much of Jesus in your marriage and in your life, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Husbands, the same thing goes for you. This will lead to mutual submission to God and mutual submission to one another. Let me speak to single folks for a second. Ladies, don't marry a guy unless his pride or his ego has been crushed by the gospel. Unless he's lost his self-centeredness. Don't trust yourself to a man unless he has been filled with the Spirit of God. He may go to church, he may do good deeds, he may talk a good, good game. I'm not saying that. Is he filled with the Spirit of God? Is there thankfulness that flows out of him? Is there joy that comes out of him? Is 
Is he willing to put others before himself? Is he controlled by the Spirit of God or is he controlled by something else? Be women that are filled with the Spirit of God. Let you, may you be known for the joy that's in you. May you be known for thankfulness for all the good things that God has blessed you with. May you be known for um, being one that's willing to put the preferences of other people above yourself. Because when you do that, you display the gospel to the world that desperately needs it. The second thing he says is wives in submission. It's a controversial subject. But we'll look at the passage and we'll see what Paul has to say about it and why this needs to take place. And he gives three reasons. Number one, the authority of the command. Wives submit, period. That's it. We can finish. Joking. It's not about ability. (laughs) My wife is going to kill me today. Um, It's not about talking about ability. It's not about talking about giftedness. It's not even talking about status. It's talking about function here. Completely different subject. Men are not more important than women, but both have roles and functions to play within the family. You can't have two quarterbacks on the same team in the same game playing at the same time. Your team will fail and lose if you have quarterbacks fighting over who the ball is going to be snapped to. The model for this is the Trinity. In the Trinity, we see Jesus the Son in submission to the Father. But he's not inferior to the Father. We would never say that. He's God himself. But he's in submission to the Father. The wife is to follow the role of the Son of God in that. Jesus in function is submitted to the father. The wife in in function is to submit to the husband. We know this from experience. You can't function without authority and submission. There would be absolute chaos in the world. Think about it. Think about it if no one ran this country. If there was no police, if there was no law, if there was no government, there would be absolute chaos. The same way in the family. There has to be someone in charge. Someone has to make the final decision. Voting doesn't work too well if there's only two people voting. Think about it for a second. Who yells the loudest at the home shouldn't be the determining factor. Who makes the most money in the home is not the determining factor. God has set it up this way where the husband is called to lead the home. We also need to understand that when God gives this command, his character is attached to it. What I mean by that is that God is good. When it is followed the way that it is, should be followed, there's great joy to the family. It is great to be a wife, to be a husband, to be a kid in a, in a home that submits to the authority of God. God is not demeaning wives or putting them down, but uplifting them so that they can maximize their joy. Freedom is implied in the command. How is freedom, how is there freedom in, the submission, in submission? You know, you find a lot of freedom when you submit. For example, a train is free to run properly when it's submitted to the tracks. You take it off the tracks, it will crash. It will destroy everything in front of it. A fish is not free when it's flopping around in your front yard. When it's out of water, it's not free at all. It's going to die. It needs to submit itself to the context into which God has created it. That's the way all of God's commands are to work in our lives. Freedom has to have restrictions or it's not freedom at all, but chaos and death. But you say, wives, you say, I'm actually smarter than him. I'm actually better than him. My husband's a little slow and maybe he is. He doesn't do anything right and maybe he doesn't. I would say, yeah, that may be right and it may even be true and you can prove that to me. But there's no footnotes in this passage. Submission is not whether you are more gifted or smarter than your husband. But a wise husband, guys, will lead his home. He will delegate authority on certain things that she is better than than him. For example, money. Maybe you waste all your money, guys, and she knows how to save it. Being in charge of the home doesn't mean that you have to rule over it. Maybe it says, hey, she's smarter at the finances. Let her handle it. It's delegating responsibilities in the home. Good leadership is allowing people to get better by encouraging her in her gifts at where she's at. That's good godly leadership. Single ladies, don't marry a dumb guy. You're thinking, oh, he looks good, but he isn't too bright. He's cute. He's so lovable. I'll fix him later. You're not. 
If he's dumb now, he'll be dumb later. Don't go for that. He may be cute, but that's not what you want for the rest of your life. Ten years down the line, a year down the line, if all he is is cute, you'll get tired of him. Get a puppy. Number two, the lordship of Christ. Submit to your husband as to the Lord. The way that you submit to your husband is the way that you submit to Jesus. It's a picture of that. You say that you love Jesus, that you'll do anything that he'll tell you to do, you'll submit to him, but then you cut your husband, you disrespect him, you attack him, you yell at him, you tell him to go somewhere, and you can fill in wherever that is. You know what? You don't. You don't love Jesus. That's contradictory because it's not the same. How you treat your husband is the same way you treat Jesus. The Apostle John, when he was writing um, one of his epistles, he says, whoever loves God and hates his brother is a liar. Your husband is your brother in Christ. If you say you love Jesus, but you have no respect for your husband and you treat him horribly, you don't love Jesus, plain and simple. Respect your husband. Because the scripture says you don't when you don't honor him and love him. Wives, your testing ground for your love for Jesus is the guy that you married. The days that he screws up, when you choose to love him, it's a testing ground to know whether you really love Jesus or not. The statement as to the Lord there, submit to your husband as to the Lord, implies that you submit to your husband in the same way that you submit to Jesus. See, here's where the gospel comes in again. You don't submit because you think that your husband deserves it. He probably doesn't. You don't, truth of the matter is, you know it and he knows it. He probably does not deserve you submitting to him. You're probably smarter than him. You're probably better than him. You do it because Jesus deserves it. You do it because Jesus himself submitted to death for you. This isn't about your husband. This isn't about the man you're going to marry. This has nothing to do with them. He can be the greatest husband in the world or he can be the worst husband in the world. It doesn't matter. This is about you and Jesus. This doesn't mean that you submit to everything that your husband tells you to do. Let me make myself very clear on that. Only as far as Scripture allows. If he has you doing things that are contrary to Scripture, breaking the law, you aren't called to submit to that. Let me also say, if he is beating you and says that you deserve it and that you should, you should just submit, we don't go for that here. We will not tolerate that here. Signing up for submission does not mean that you become a punching bag. That is not what submission means at all. We live in a culture where men are pigs and basically beat women and think that's good and acceptable. You're a wimp, a coward, and you're puny. That is not a biblical definition of a man. All right, moving on. Jesus is a higher authority in your life than your husband. Don't do things that will go against your walk with Jesus. Far from degrading women, Paul is elevating women here. Women were considered second class in that society. I mentioned this before, but prayer of a typical Jewish man in that culture was, God, thank you for making me, not making me a Gentile, not making me a slave, and not making me a woman. That's what Jewish men would pray every day. As a result, it was played out in life. Divorce, were, for example, would happen for anything. Oh, she burned breakfast this morning. I'm going to divorce her and marry someone else. You could divorce her for anything in that culture. The Greeks were even worse than the Jews. Most men thought of wives as someone that gave them legitimate children, but they found pleasure in sex outside of marriage. Prostitution was rampant in their culture. Women were sex, sex objects. And when Paul says, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, he says, submit it as you trust Jesus, follow Jesus. He was uplifting women in that culture. Number three, the design of creation. The husband is the head of the wife, verse 23 says. Very small detail here to note, but important. He does not say that the husband should be the head of the wife. He says that he is. Guys, you are. Whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, whether you want the leadership or not, it is yours. You're a husband, it is yours. It is the way by design, the way that God has made it. To be the head is to be the center, control center of the body. My body, my head tells my body how to function. It provides leadership to the rest of the body. Jesus is called the head of the church. That is a complementary relationship that's supposed to take place. It's not superior to inferior. When a husband and wife plays this role together well, 
it creates beautiful music. When they don't play it well, it creates horrible music. Let me say this, men, your wife, if she knows and loves Jesus, deep down she wants to submit to you. She wants you to take the leadership. She wants you to be responsible. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in our life. She wants to. You make it so hard for her. It's not because she doesn't want to. It's because you make it difficult. She wants someone to model after. She wants someone to follow. She wants to follow your leadership. She wants to model her life after you. She wants your kids to be like you. But it's so hard because you, you just don't make it easy for her. Make it easy. Get right with Jesus. The closer you are with him, the better the husband you will be. If he is the head of the church, Jesus is the head of the church, and you are the head of the wife, the closer you get to Jesus the more he will teach you to be a better leader. He will teach you what it means to lead, to love, to care, to provide for your family. Because that's what he does for us as his bride. Men, are you leading a life that your wife will want to follow? Or your future wife will want to follow? The way that you are living right now, if a woman came by, would she say that she wants to live like you? Is that the case? Are you walking closer to him? She wants to see progress she wants to see you moving and developing in life. All right, wives and significance. Wives, where, are your, where is your significance found? Where is your value found? What is it that gets you out of bed every morning? What motivates you? Is it found in working hard to be filled with the Spirit? Is it found in working hard to submitting to your husband and making him like you? Is it found in working hard to have a husband. See, this begs the question, why do pe people get married in the first place? Why should you get married? Why do women want to get married, and why is it a good thing? Why should men get married? In traditional cultures, and a lot, a lot of, most of us were brought up in, you get married for the sake of money or family name. You want to find someone who will continue to leave the legacy of your family name, and it was good for the family name or the family wealth. In modern cultures, in which a lot of us were brought up in here in the U.S., you get married for individual fulfillment. Some cultures, it's all about family, a communal, communal idea. It's about making sure the family is taken care of. In our culture today, it's more about individual fulfillment. But let me tell you, both approaches are wrong and harmful. Both of them are. The Bible gives a completely different take on this. Look at the last verse, verse 31. A man should leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it, speaking of marriage, refers to Christ and the church. What Paul is saying is that marriage is not around because God thought it was a good idea for people to get together and get married. Marriage is not around because he thought, how can I make people happy? But marriage is around because he thought, how can I illustrate my relationship to broken people. How can I illustrate my love for broken people with the people I'm going to redeem? I know. I'll create marriage. Marriage is really small when it's put into context of the ultimate greater issue of the gospel. The point of marriage is gospel reenactment. You get married for the sake of the gospel being displayed and reenacted through you. It's not about you. If the gospel is where your significance is found, if that is what you want to put on display for a world, then here's what happens. You aren't looking to marry someone that meets every requirement in your book. Your criteria now becomes changed. You're not looking for a finished product. You're not looking for someone that's absolutely gorgeous or beautiful. You're not looking for someone that's financially stable. That's not gospel reenactment. That's the modern idea of the purpose of marriage about being for your own gratification and your individual fulfillment. But what does the gospel say? The gospel says that Jesus married you not for any of those reasons, but for the sake of the glory of the Father, for the sake of displaying his glory. And that's what we do in marriage. That means that to fall in love ultimately means to see a person's potential in displaying the gospel with you. It's not about you. It's to fall in love with the vision of two spirit-filled people living their lives for God's glory and now glorifying God together. You can't do that with someone who doesn't know Jesus. 
That's a false gospel that you're presenting to the world. Falling in love is when one spirit-filled person of one sex meets another spirit-filled person of another sex and starts getting attracted to what God is doing in their lives. It is to imagine yourself on the day of judgment standing before God, your Father, and everything wrong in you falls off and you blossom into what you're supposed to be. To fall in love is with someone is to imagine being with him or her on that day and telling him, I always knew that this would be you. I saw it in you. I had a part in that, pro- in that process. I played a role in you becoming who God called you to be. I'm going to do what Jesus has done for me. I'm going to commit myself to, that, to their flourishing and their good. I'm going to be a vehicle in their life for what God wants me to do. See, that completely changes the view of marriage. It's not about your satisfaction. It's not about your fulfillment. It's about how do we together glorify God. A lot of us view marriage like a grocery store. All of us have a grocery store we go to, right? I mean, it could be a neighborhood grocery store. We get to know the people there. You have your favorite checkout line because you know the person's fast. They give us reasonable prices. It's a... It's a business idea. You like them, you go there because it's convenient. You're a consumer and they pr- provide service. After a while of going there, a new grocery store pops up. It could be a little closer. It could be have better prices. It could have better service. And you decide that you will change stores and go to the new one. They take care of me. This is a consumeristic culture that eventually we play into marriage. And so now we function in marriage in the very same way. Marriage is actually called a covenant relationship, not a consumer relationship, because the gospel isn't about getting anything, it's about serving. The gospel isn't about what you receive, it's about serving. It's about meeting the needs of the other person. It's about growing in covenant together. It's, it's not saying, I will meet your needs if you meet mine. That's not the case at all. It says, I will meet your needs even if you don't meet mine, because here's the key, Jesus has already met my deepest needs. I am content in him. I found my identity in him. I found satisfaction in him. I found joy in him. I am satisfied in Jesus. Now I can serve you whether you give me something or not. That's the key to marriage. Ladies, where is your significance found? It just can't be in marriage. It can't be in just finding a spouse. It can't be in just in your spouse. Marriage is much greater than that. It is actually just a picture of something much more significant, the relationship between Jesus and the church, the relationship between Jesus and you. If your husband is ultimate, if he is where you find your significance and value in, then three things will happen. Either you'll grow bitter toward him, you will attack him, or you will leave him. Those are your only three options. Because he isn't able to meet your deepest needs. No guy will ever be able to do that. The person sitting next to you will never be able to do that. The truth is he can't do that even if he was the world's greatest husband. The truth is that you are spirit-filled, you submitting or not submitting has nothing to do with your husband, but everything to do with how much you value the gospel. Jesus is our savior. His love for you is the only love that you can bear under. No human relationship can ever ultimately support you. No human being is ever going to be able to lift you up for so long. They will fall under the weight of you. Not literally, but you know what I mean. You may feel like there are days that your husband will neglect you, is mean to you, is cruel to you, will forget you. May I remind you that Jesus was actually rejected for you as well. The world turned his back, their back on him. In fact, the only one who ever found only one who ever said you are good on the cross as he looks to his father for consolation his father turns his back on him he did that for you he was abandoned for you so that you could be brought in he went to the cross for you his is the ultimate definition of love it is where your significance can be found it is where your joy can be found you can be the spouse that God has called you to be you can love you can forgive you can be patient you can be kind you can do this because your significance is found in Jesus and what he thinks of you ladies you don't need a man 
You need a champion. That is Jesus. He is your ultimate significance. And if your significance is found there, you can be the most amazing woman. You can be the most amazing wife. You can be the most amazing mother. All of those things, if you find your significance in Jesus. This morning we come to the table. We come not because there's anything good in us. We come not because we deserve to be here. But we come because we recognize that in and of ourselves there's nothing good. But we come knowing that because of Jesus, I have ultimate joy. All of my needs are met. I have been accepted. I have been loved. I have been acknowledged by the one that matters. And my hope is not in my spouse. My identity is not identified in my job or my career or who I marry or how many children I have or what they do. But my identity is first and foremost, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. So we come to the table this morning. We come that in and of ourselves saying, God, if you did not save me, if you did not send Jesus to die for me, my life would be a mess. I would be a disaster. But while I was yet a sinner, you sent your son to rescue me from my mess, to redeem me. You've given me a new name. You've given me a new identity. You've given me new purpose. And now my purpose in life is to bring glory, honor to my Father. So we come to the table this morning. Would you examine your hearts? Is there anything in your life that doesn't bring glory and honor to Jesus? If so, would you repent? Would you examine and would you say, God, I'm struggling here. I need your grace. And would you come to the table saying, God, I can't do this on my own, but I need your help. But would you also come looking at the table and saying, God, thank you for loving me because I don't think I deserve to be loved, but you love me. You love me more than I could ever imagine, more than I could ever dream. So would you examine your hearts, your affections? Would you look to Jesus? And let's come to the table and we'll take together.